Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Heather Campion, CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America, Raytheon, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, Xfinity, the Boston Globe, and WBUR. This is our first New Frontier Network Forum of the season, so we also wish to thank Viacom for their support of this remarkable program. The New Frontier Network was established by the Kennedy Library Foundation to engage a new generation of leaders interested in President Kennedy's call to service. Through a variety of events and initiatives, the network seeks to keep President Kennedy's legacy alive. We have over 100 members of the New Frontier Network here today and hope that many more of you will join by visiting our website, jfklibrary.org. Now, if you've been following the buzz about Kirsten Gillibrand's new memoir, Off the Sidelines, you are aware that more famous men than me have caused offense with comments about the senator's physical attributes. <laughs> but I don't think anyone would disagree with this statement. Is this not the cutest baby photo ever? <laughs> Without question, a United States senator in the making co calling for cold cash at age 11, <laughs> at age one, excuse me. In fact, we learn in this wonderful new book that Kirsten Rutnick grew up steeped in political campaigns, stuffing envelopes and staffing phone banks from a young age. Her grandmother, Polly Noonan, you see, was a linchpin in New York state politics once known to lace up her roller skates to better traverse the marble halls of the State House in Albany. <laughs> Described by a journalist as running an exceptionally successful political machine, Polly replied that she preferred to call what she had built a well-oiled organization. A machine has no heart. No one questions whether Kirsten Gillibrand has a heart, in fact, the list of social causes for which he advocates is so long that John Stewart recently mocked her for focusing, quote, solely on efforts to improve people's lives. <laughs> Teasing, you got a lot to learn, Gillibrand. Whether fancy new rollerblades or old-fashioned shoe leather, many in Washington today wonder about the secret to Senator Gillibrand's phenomenal political success and meteoric rise improbably defeating a long-term incumbent in a solidly Republican district to earn her first seat in Congress, recording the highest margin of victory in New York's history, garnering 72% of the vote as part of her most recent United States Senate re-election campaign, successfully securing federal funding to provide health care coverage for workers who fell ill after cleaning the 9-11 crash site, passing a law that bans members of Congress and their staffs from trading securities based on political information, fiercely advocating to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, leading the crusade to reduce sexual assault in the military and on college campuses, serving as a mother of two young sons, and now writing a best-selling autobiography, signed copies of which are on sale in our bookstore. Our moderator this afternoon is the senior senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, who spoke here last spring when her memoir, A Fighting Chance, was published. Allow me to share just two brief scenes from that book that are fixed in my mind. The first occurs at her family's kitchen table in Oklahoma. She applied to college without her parents' knowledge, only to learn that to receive the necessary scholarships, she'd have to provide a copy of the family's tax return. Over her mother's quiet objections, her father surprisingly replied, why don't we let her try, Polly? Decades later, having graduated from college and law school, she attempted to launch a teaching career in Texas while raising her two children after separating from her first husband. One night, she called her Aunt B back in Oklahoma and broke down in tears, describing the stress she was under. Well, Aunt B replied, I can't get there tomorrow, but I can come on Thursday. Now, I'm not as caustic as John Stewart, but really, Senator Aunt B? <laughs> like the character from Mayberry RFD, who you tell us then arrived with seven suitcases and a dog named Buddy who together slept on your couch and helped you raise your son and daughter into two incredibly fine adults, 
It all sounds a little too far-fetched for us skeptics here in Massachusetts. <laughs> in all seriousness, Elizabeth Warren knows the struggles of America's working families because she has lived them and is now regarded as this country's greatest defender of the little guy or gal in the halls of Congress during debates over bankruptcy law and in standing up to corporations which too often benefit their shareholders and CEOs by focusing exclusively on the bottom line, even if it means profiting from others' suffering. Senator Gillibrand, Senator Warren, you honor us with your presence here today. We salute your willingness to come off the sidelines, to enter the political fray, and to fight for a more equitable world. I want to make one other observation. There's a special significance to having these two United States Senators on this stage. For Senator Gillibrand holds the seat once occupied by Robert F. Kennedy, and Senator Warren's seat was formerly held by the man whose legacy we honor in this institution, and then by the legendary Edward M. Kennedy. As you may know, As you may know, last month marked the fifth anniversary of Senator Kennedy's passing. No one better animated this library with the spirit of his departed siblings, and fittingly, after his death, his body lay in repose in this very hall. I will never forget the tens of thousands who came to pay their last respects, immigrant families, civil rights giants, laborers, the mighty and the poor, to recognize an extraordinary life of compassion and political accomplishment. In my, in my mind, we re-consecrate this space in his and his brother's honor when we gather for conversations like this afternoon's forum and during naturalization ceremonies such as the one held here a few days ago with over 200 immigrants becoming new citizens. I can picture Senator Kennedy looking upon us now with a twinkle in his eye and at his side the likes of Margaret Chase Smith, Shirley Chisholm, and Richards and Barbara Jordan all brimming with hope and pride to see these two emerging Linuses of the United States Senate and to hear them roar. <laughs> Thank you. That is a truly wonderful introduction, and I do like to think that all three of the Kennedy brothers would be delighted to look down and see that the two of us hold their seats. So it is, it is wonderful to be here today. Um, you know, it does make me proud to be from Massachusetts, to be here, where people like to hear about books and talk about books. And so I want to dive <laughs> right in <laughs> to this book, uh, which you start, Kirsten, with a rather blunt and bleak confession. You say, and I'm quoting here, I'm angry and I'm depressed and I'm scared that the women's movement is dead or at least on life support. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think in too many halls of power, women's voices aren't being heard. And the reason why I wrote this book and told stories about my mentors and role models from Hillary Clinton to my mom, who was only one of three women in her law school class, and I remember you know, working on the phone on an adoption case and making dinner all at the same time, and me just looking in awe of her, and my grandmother, who loved politics and got us involved in campaigns from the earliest age and sweaty headquarters with lots of older ladies with their arms jiggling as they stuffed the envelopes. <laughs> Watch so it. I, have, <laughs> I was really young, but that's what I remember. Anyway, so I had such great role models and then Hillary being this incredible person who finally got me off the stick to do something political. But what I've seen is that you know in Congress, only 20 women in the Senate, only 18% in the House, Corporate America, only 3% are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. But in my life experience, I've recognized that women's voices really do change the debate. Our perspective on what the issue actually is and what the possible solutions are is so different. And if we have more women's voices being heard in each of these places, whether it's the PTA meeting or whether it's in the White House, you're going to raise more issues. You're going to have a different array of, of possibilities for how to figure out the problems. 
and I think America would be stronger for it. Oh, good for you. So <laughs> she agrees. I'm in that. That sounds good. She so, agrees. so, but let's let's pull this apart a little bit. So you grew up with these incredibly strong role models, mm -hmm. just wonderful stories in here about your mom and your grandmother, mm -hmm. both of whom were called Polly. Yes. Is that yeah. right? That must have been a little bit confusing. Well, my mother, when she was younger, her nickname was Penny. So she, that's okay. how they differentiate. Okay. But she goes by Polly now. You know, that was my mother's name. Too. I saw that uh, in your right. book. That's exactly right. So we are the daughters you know, the of The things Polly's I here. noticed about her book, <laughs> like that she liked her husband because he was a tennis player, had nice legs. I, that's what I remember from her book. <laughs> <laughs> we all pick up different things. We okay. all pick up different things. <laughs> I don't think that's what the bankers were focused no, on. No, no, um, not at all. But, but like a lot of us, uh, your big life plans sometimes got detoured. You For know, sure. I got a scholarship to go to college. Then at 19, uh, dropped out of school to get married. Uh, you made your decision about where to go to law school based on- On a boyfriend. A boyfriend, I, I hope he was at least hunky. Uh, who you, who you <laughs> thought- Tennis player. That's right, you thought you were gonna marry, ended up not, so we were both really smart when we were 19, 20, 21. Um, so I have a question. You, you went off to law school to follow this boy. Yes. It didn't work out. Yeah. Do you regret your decision? No, not at all. I mean, I, I would have never gone to California. It was not something I would, would have picked for myself, but I got to see a whole other part of the country. Yeah. I got to go to a big state school. UCLA was an incredible education. Uh, and I really got to see a diversity of experiences that were really important to me. Um, I did come back to New York right away. I wanted to uh, get my, uh, law, my um, bar exam done in New York, so I came back to New York and I started at a big law firm. But um, you know, all of our experiences, it's, it's what makes us who we are. So you certainly can't, and one of the reasons why I have a chapter called From A to B with Detours is because no one can plan out your life perfectly. You're never gonna have the 20-20 you know, vision of knowing how to get from A to B the fastest, but it's, it's okay because through each of your life experiences, you're gonna learn something about yourself. I also talk a lot about it's okay to lose, it's okay to fail because sometimes you're not gonna make the best decisions, but through those failures, you will learn how to be stronger, better, you'll know what your opponent you know, is gonna do next time. It, there's a lot of benefits from living life and not always getting it right. Yeah, so, so you talk about <clears throat> what it was like to be in a big law firm. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've made it through, you've made it through school, you take the bar, and you talk about working your heart out mm -hmm. to make partner, mm -hmm. but you say you didn't place enough importance on personal relationships. Yeah. So here's my question. Do you think a man would ever make that statement? No, he would have been playing golf with the boss. Like, it wouldn't have even been a question. Like, it, it, it was, so, so what the, what I tell these stories particularly about what it's like to be a young professional woman because for me, that was the stage in my career where I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, I didn't know how to get from A to B. I didn't realize, you know, in a law firm setting, having a sponsor is really important. I sort of understood mentors mattered, but I just didn't really know. And I, tell, I share a story about how I used to be asked to play tennis a lot. I was a tennis player uh, at, at Dartmouth, and I'd be asked to play with the partners, and I thought, you know, sure, I'll go play. I'll fill in for your fourth. And I played for almost two years, but I thought, oh, is this undermining me in some way? Is this making me look less than serious? Is this, is this you know, sh showing that I'm too fun-loving and not focused on the law or my work enough? And so eventually I just stopped playing. And I just told the partners, oh, you know, I'm really playing squash these days. I really don't want to play because I, I didn't know what to say. But looking back, if I was advising my 25-year-old self, I would have said, of course you should do that. You can build a relationship and maybe one of those partners would become your sponsor. Maybe one of those guys would say, you know, you really, you have tenacity, you work hard, you know, I'm gonna put you on my case. And then he could see my work and then you develop the kind of rapport that ultimately that partner would make sure you made partner. But I didn't know that. Um, and a lot of times we don't, you know, we're, a lot of women, oftentimes we need that mentor. And that's why I tell the stories about Hillary. Hillary gave me advice at certain parts in my career, and by the time I got elected to Congress, it added to a total of 90 minutes. But she made the difference, because every time I had a tough question, I was able to call her and say, you know, did you see my poll? What do you think? Can I? And she just gave that five minutes of advice that was the difference. And so we can all be mentors to women who are maybe further down on the ladder than we are. And that little bit of life that you've already lived, that might be the, just the piece of advice she needs. Yeah. So you make a very good point about mentors mm -hmm. and how much both we need them and how much we can be, be them, the mentors. Yeah. 
But I also hear another part to that story. And what I also hear you throughout this doing is questioning yourself. All the time. So there you were, you're out playing tennis, you're working your heart out, you're working till 11 o'clock every night. And yet constantly asking, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right. wrong? Talk a little more about that. Well, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of young women have is sometimes we doubt ourselves. We don't believe in ourselves or we think, oh, I'm not good enough, not smart enough. And so I talk about, you know, ambition is not a dirty word. You should not only embrace Can what you Can we have an amen on that? Yeah. <laughs> Encouraging young women to not only uh, embrace what their goals are, but be willing to fight for it. When I first ran for Congress, and this is you know a political story, nobody thought I had a chance of winning except for my mother. Um, and it's, oh, it's often our moms who really are there. And for you, it was your dad. It was your dad who was always in your corner, which I loved. Um, my dad, not so much. He, you know, he nicknamed me Foghorn when I was little and Loudmouth, which he eventually graciously shortened to mouth because I was just always arguing with him about everything. But uh, despite that, I had enough women role models that were always constantly cheering me on and encouraging me. And so when I decided I wanted to run for office, I really had to own that ambition. And it, it, it wasn't any meeting I took that the person I was asking for help would say, oh, good for you. Good thing you're running. Nobody thought I ever could win. And so for that girl who says, I want to be a scientist at age five, I want her to continue to aspire to be that scientist. There's a little girl in Henry's class named Irina. And they had to write their hopes and dreams at age five. And most of the girls did what we typically do. I want to meet a new friend. I want to have a picnic with my family. All these things about our community and the people we love. But only Irina had this ambition to become something, to become a professional, and it's to be a scientist. And that's why I spend so much time helping women and girls focus on their, their, their career ambitions and their long-term goals in life, because they need to be encouraged. So you were this incredibly hard-working kid. I mean, you say so yourself, yeah. that you wanted every gold star. That... Yeah, I was the massive kiss ass, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that uh, there are pictures in here of your room. Yeah, very you clean. You know, that you kept it all clean, clean and everything was very precise. <laughs> So you get out there, you really bust your tail. You know, yeah. you, you go to college, you play sports, you go to law school, you do very well, you pass the New York bar, which is a tough bar. You're in a big New York law firm, really making it happen. But then you have this light bulb moment mm. that totally changes the direction of your life. So tell people about it. So I am sitting uh, at my desk in, in New York City as a big lawyer at a big law firm. I, I wind up going to law school because my mom went to law school, and I love that she could help families represent, you know, you know, adopt their first child or buy their first home, and all this, the way she helped normal people navigate something complex, and I really admired that. So I went off to law school, and I start my big job in New York City, and I hadn't done anything political. I, I really, the last time I did something political is when I was 10 years old, helping my grandmother stuff envelopes and go door to door and, and helping her in her community. And I remember hearing about Hillary Clinton going to China. She was our first lady. She went to Beijing. She gave her famous speech, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. And I was so upset with myself because I didn't know about the conference. I had been an Asian studies major at Dartmouth. I had learned Mandarin. I had studied in Beijing. And our first lady was giving this powerful message from a stage in Beijing, and I wasn't even part of it. And so I realized at that moment, you know, I would only have been invited to that event if I was involved in politics. So I called a lady, and she's right over there. Her name's Nancy Hoyt, because her Hi, daughter, Sarah Hoyt, was in at Dartmouth with me, and we played tennis together. And I knew Nancy was involved with Al Gore. And so I called up Nancy. I was like, Nancy, I really want to get involved in politics. What do I do? And she said, well, there's this new women's group in New York called the Women's Leadership Forum. You should join them. And so I said, OK. And so I uh, call up the lady in charge of it and say, you know, I'd like to join the Women's Leadership Forum. And she says, oh, we'd love to have you, but you have to write a check for $1,000. I'm like, $1,000? That is a lot of money. That was my red check. So I was immediately worried that this was something beyond me. But I thought about it. And I thought, the only advice I've been given up until now is to do this. So I'm not going to disregard that advice. I'm going to do it. And so I write the check. And the first event that I get to go to as part of this group was an event that Hillary Clinton was going to speak at. And so it was at this very fancy club in, in New York City. And I, I show up. And I'm you know, maybe 28, 29, 30, something like that, not, not, not very old, wearing my best suit. And I'm standing in the back. All the women are much older than me, 10, 20, even 30 years older. Um, but she says something at that meeting that totally shook me to the core. She said, Decisions are being made every day in Washington. And if you are not part of those decisions and you don't like what they say, 
You have no one to blame but yourself. And I thought, oh my God, she's talking to me. She's talking to me. I'm going to have to do something about this. And so I just felt like it was that moment when, and I literally started to sweat. I was sweating there saying, thinking this anxiety that she's telling me I have to run for office. And I was so embarrassed. I, I couldn't even admit to myself at that age that I aspired to run for office. So what I did feel comfortable doing is getting involved. And so I started to raise money for um, candidates all across our state and our city. I started working on campaigns. I, when she ran for Senate, I just jumped at the chance to volunteer for her. And it made a difference because the more I got involved, the more confidence I got. And, and within about 10 years is when I made my decision to run for office. And uh, I had to ask my lovely husband, who just graduated from Columbia with a degree in venture capital, how would you feel about moving to upstate New York uh, to raise our family? There's not a lot of venture capital in upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> but I married the right guy, and he said yes. And so, um, but the reason I tell that story and share these intimate details is that to assure young women that they can have any ambition they want. There's nothing they cannot do if they put their mind to it and work really hard. And, and knowing that and believing that is, is different than just advising someone. Because even it was hard for me to know that, believe that, and then aspire for what I really dreamed to do. So Kirsten, you tell very, very candidly about how you got in the front door. You wrote a check. And you kept writing checks. You went to those luncheons mm -hmm. that were fundraisers. Mm -hmm. And so there were lots of checks. And bless your heart, you could do that because... So I was a young lawyer. I had plenty you were a of young disposable lawyer. income. Exactly. You had plenty of disposable income. Talk for just a minute to young people who don't have that kind of money but who have the passion. How do they get into it? Well, it, you know, it depends what your passion is. You know, you may think politics is the worst and you would never do anything in politics. So, you know, getting involved could be a whole host of things. So I'll tell you the political answer, and then I'll tell you the non-political answer. So someone who asks, can I get involved in politics, I say, just volunteer on a campaign. I can't tell you how meaningful it is. And that's the lesson my grandmother taught me. I mean, they, their campaigns never had a dime. It was all about stuffing envelopes, going door to door, putting bumper stick, stickers on cars, being heard. And these women, over their life, no one gave them power. No one told them they were important. They earned it. Over 50 years, you couldn't get elected in Albany if you didn't have the blessing of my grandmother and her lady friends, because they did all the work. There was no one else who was going to get you elected. Um, on other issues, though, you'd be so surprised how much power you have as an individual who cares about something. I've had two young women show up into my office, no appointment, saying, we want to talk to the senator. My staff made that happen, and we sat down. And then, of course, their story is heartbreaking. They were raped on college campuses. They reported the rape. No one believed them. They were blamed, and then they were retaliated against by their universities. And they took that moment of absolute horror and depression and and a refusal to be believed, and they turned it around. They became advocates. They've been to college campuses all across the United States. They've started a movement. They've been so good at their advocacy. We now have a draft piece of legislation, which we are now trying to push to actually change the rules about how this is dealt with campus. And, and, and you know, you can be involved in anything. And another story, just one more, because these are regular young women who would have no reason to be powerful. This young woman um, read one of my emails where I sent out to my supporters and said, you know, help some women's organizations. Dress for Success is a great organization. It gives suits to women who want to get a job. It helps them write their resume. It helps them uh, learn how to interview and then monitors their progress for a year. And so this young girl sitting in Buffalo said, oh, what a great idea. I'm totally going to do that. She picks up all her suits. She looks for the phone, tries to call. There's no Dress for Success. So she calls the national chapter and said, is there one in Buffalo or anyone near Buffalo? And they said, no, there's not. Okay, instead of just putting her clothes back in her closet, she founded the Dress for Success in <laughs> Buffalo. And that's incredible. So now she is helping hundreds of women start out their first jobs just because she cared. And so the whole point of the book is it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what issue you care about. If you raise your voice, if you are heard on it, the world will be better off because of you. I like that. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the irritating parts. Um, <laughs> when I ran for the Senate, it bothered me when I would get the question, which I did a lot of times, especially at the beginning, what's it like to run as a woman? I was pretty sure my opponent was not getting the question, what's it like to run as a man? And you say the question that drives 
you crazy, is can a woman have it all? <laughs> so talk to me about this. Yeah. What, how do you feel about these questions, and how do you handle these questions? Um, well, your book, you provide the best role model ever in terms of how you can be a great mom and do your job in the way you do. Uh -huh. You do need help, which is no one's saying you don't. Um, but the reason why I hate the question, because it's framed as having it all, well, what are we actually having? Are we having a party? Are we having a slice of pie? What are we having? We're not having anything. In fact, women are doing it all and have been doing it all for a very, very long time. And so I share, I share anecdotal stories about sort of my juggle, because my juggle, my struggles are common. You know, how do you feed your kids breakfast, make the school lunch, find the soccer, room, soccer uniform, get yourself in some passable shape, and out the door at eight? It's hard for every mom, any working parent. But I also raise the bigger and broader issues of what about all those women who have no flexibility, no support in their job, not a loving husband who will unload the dishwasher, um, or having a family member to come and help care for your children when you're totally stressed out. What about all those women who have low-wage jobs, who have no sick days, who have no vacation days, who if their child is sick and, or if their, their informal caregiver is sick and have to miss work, they will either get fired for missing work that day or they certainly will never be eligible to be promoted. And we call that dynamic the sticky floor. So the real challenges we need to debate is not just breaking the glass ceiling, which is important, but also how do we make sure all women have a chance to rise? And that's a lot of support. It means affordable daycare and universal pre-K. It means paid leave. We're the only industrialized country in the world, in the world, that doesn't have paid leave. Afghanistan and Pakistan have more leave than we do in this country. So, and those are not paradigms of, human, of women's rights. So we have a long way to go in terms of just supporting women and families in the workplace. And so I talk a lot about that as well because we should be really focusing this debate on how we help all women. Women are graduating more than half the college degrees, more than half the advanced degrees. We have a lot of talent, we have a lot to offer. And I like the way Geraldine Ferraro said it in her convention speech, it's not what America can do for women, it's what women can do for America. Exactly right. So, but let's, uh, let's hear a little more of the personal part of this, Kirsten. Uh, you know, you talk about, um, uh, in your book, yep. uh, you have two young sons. Mm -hmm. They are with you in Washington. Your husband is in New York during the week. And you manage your full Senate schedule yep. without a nanny yeah. and pull it all together. I have to say, that sounds a little like superwoman. So how are you pulling this off? Well, um, my job, unlike most working women's jobs, I have a lot of flexibility. So if one of my kids is sick, I can bring them to the office with me. If I have to... So that's why there have been all those colds running around the Senate. <laughs> yeah. Pretty I'm much. I'm wondering yeah. about that. Yeah, okay. That, yeah. All okay. right. Good. Um, so, so if I have to bring it to the office, I can. If uh, I can also set my schedule, so I can say I'm not doing any meetings before seven. You know, we have a big breakfast circuit in Washington. I don't usually participate in it. I will bring my kids to school, and dr their drop-off time is eight twenty, so I can get to the office closer to nine. Or if I go to the gym, maybe nine thirty. So um, I build my schedule around my needs. If I need to, but it does get funny actually. So between five and, and seven. I try not to do meetings either so I can pick them up from school, make them dinner, get them to their relevant soccer practice, baseball practice, piano lesson, whatever it happens to be that day. But the funniest thing is when, is when we have votes during that time, because that's the one thing I, I have no flexibility. I got to vote. I got to vote. I got to vote. So I bring Henry and Theo with me, and it's funny, because these, you know, my lovely colleagues, you know, they're, I'm, they're like their grandchildren, and, and they don't know what to quite say, because they're like, hmm, what are these children doing here? <laughs> um, but they're very nice and very supportive, but I have nowhere to put them during a vote where I can keep my eye on them, which is fine for a 10-year-old, because a 10-year-old will sit there and play with an iPad and be very responsible. I would not say that so much when my youngest Henry was four and five and six. He's, you know, he could wander off. So we finally got permission to, which you're not allowed to have anybody except for a center approach these Senate doors where you go in. So I got permission to hold Henry's hand to get to the door and I can lean in and vote. Um, I got yelled at for it the last week though, so the solution is still me? not perfect. Yeah, because not all the aides were told. So he's not allowed, he's not allowed. I was like, okay, he's gonna sit in your chair then, right here while I go vote. <laughs> So that worked out. But you know, that does raise the point. <laughs> but it does raise the point about how in many ways the deck is still stacked. Yeah, it's not against easy. younger women who have families in all kinds of workplaces. And 
you've gotten a lot of media attention. In fact, Tom mm -hmm. was just talking about it, about the, the comments that our colleagues yeah. have made about you that are just highly inappropriate. Ridiculous. So I'll tell you the funniest one because this is funny. So, <laughs> so after I got elected in 2006, uh, I, I got pregnant that year. And so when you're pregnant, Congresswoman, it's a rare thing. When I had Henry, uh, yeah, it's very rare. When I had Henry, I was only the sixth woman in the history of America to be a pregnant Congresswoman. So out to here, and I was not a small pregnant lady. I was a very, very lovely pregnant lady. And so I am out to here, and one of these Southern Congressmen who I know well and like, he just walks up to me and he puts his arm around me. He said, Kirsten, and I'm like eight months pregnant, Kirsten, you're even pretty when you're fat. It's like, <laughs> I'm not fat, I'm pregnant. Like, you can't say that to me. And you just smile there and wonder, what planet are these guys from? <laughs> but um, I did not take offense. I did not take offense at that moment. But some, some of these comments are just so outrageous and crazy. But the reason why I took the time to include them, to include my personal stories, is because they're illustrations of the broader challenges. These are not comments that women don't get at the workplace in all jobs, in all industries, at all levels. And you know, as a person in my stage of career, it's not hurtful, it doesn't bother me, it, it doesn't affect me. These aren't my bosses, they're colleagues. But it really affects you when you're younger. And I have to tell you, when you're more junior, and I, was, I include the story of being the young lawyer in the law firm, and I can't tell you how crushing it was when I worked months and months and months on a very tough case canceled vacations, canceled weekends, um, really put my all into a case to do a good job. And at the celebratory dinner, my, the partner I was working for, you know, he, he said, I want to congratulate Kirsten for her hard work, but don't you just love her haircut? Doesn't she look great? And my jaw drops because I'm like, are you kidding me? You're talking about how I look when you should be talking about my job performance? It was like a slap in the face. It was a punch in the gut because you just were reduced to how you look when your whole job is about doing a good job for your, your client. And so how do we change this? Well, we have to be the partners in the law firms, change the climate, and make sure <laughs> it doesn't there. happen. And so it takes a lot of us. And it also, takes, it also takes elevating the debate. It's really important that we have these conversations because for the unwitting person who makes these stupid comments, they need to know these aren't OK. You know, you really are undermining that young woman's self-confidence. You're reducing her to her looks, not her performance. And that hurts her, that hurts her ability to be confident, to push ahead. And so I want the young women who choose to read this book to push ahead and say, this doesn't define me. I'm going to you know, not only be become partner someday, but I'm going to run this law firm. I'm going to run this company. I'm going to be in charge. And I'm going to make sure no one treats others that way. Sometimes you don't have the ability to respond at the moment because he's your boss or would probably you know, diminish you in some way or, or hurt your career chances. Every woman will take, make her own judgments about what to do in that moment. That is her choice, her decision. But we have to change the rules of the road. And if more women become elevated into these positions of power and decision making, it will happen less. Good. Yeah. So <laughs> talking about the deck being stacked against you, you talk about in your book about how when you got to the Senate, you wanted to lead the charge on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, an mm -hmm. issue you felt very passionately about. Mm -hmm. But the White House told you they wanted someone more senior mm -hmm. to be in charge. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little about that fight. And do you wish you hadn't backed down on that one? No, no. Um, so the issue of Don't Ask, Don't Tell came to me when, and it's, it's so poignant that we're here, because Ted Kennedy was our greatest champion on gay rights. Yes, he was. Um, he was. And when I was first appointed to the Senate, he had been diagnosed with brain cancer. And so we were all worried and praying, and it was a very tough time in the Senate. And a friend of mine, a woman who um, had a client, um, Lieutenant Dan Choi, called me and said, can you meet with my client Dan about gay rights in the military? I said, I'd be delighted. So I set up the meeting, I meet with him, and then he tells me a story about how you know, he joins the military because he believes in it. He believes in its honesty, its integrity, its call to action, and how he ex you know, performs extremely well, gets all these levels of decoration and responsibility. And he falls in love. And when he fell in love, you know, his world changed. He wanted everyone to know the man he loved and how important it was, but he would have to be silent. He couldn't share 
with anybody who he loved and, and what was important to him. And so I looked into it and I realized Ted was our biggest champion and no one was carrying the bill right now. And so I wrote a bill and I started talking to my colleagues and I found I had far more support than I thought I did and support in really high places. Harry Reid said, Kirsten, I'm with you. I will do whatever it takes to get that policy repealed. He writes a letter to President Obama and says, we want this included in your agenda. Um, I talked to Carl Levin, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and he says, Kirsten, I'm with you. And I said, will you hold a hearing? He said, yes, I will hold the first hearing ever on the policy in 16 years. We established we'd lost 13,000 personnel, more than 10% of our foreign language speakers. We were really undermining military readiness. And so I'm, I've written this bill. I'm really excited to drop it and start. And I'm talking to the Republicans who I think will be with us, like Susan Collins and Olympia Snow. And we get a call from the White House. And they're like, Kirsten, we don't want you to drop your bill. I was like, why? Because, and this wasn't to me, this was through staff. No one ever, President Obama did not call me and say, Kirsten, you can't do this. Um, that, <laughs> you know. Um, but th th it was clear to me, it was clear to me that um, they really cared about it and they thought, you're new, we don't know if you're going to be good at this job, we have no idea if you can get this done, and the person we really want to lead is Joe Lieberman, because he is senior, he's on, I wasn't even on armed services at the time, he's on armed services, and we think he'll give, you know, it, it will be the right political messenger, because he's very much seen as an independent and a moderate on, on national security. And I thought long and hard about it, and I realized, you know what, it's not about me. I don't have to have my name on this bill. I do not have to be in charge of this bill. I can fight like heck to make sure it gets passed, and you bet your bottom dollar sure did. And so, so maybe my job became the biggest nudge in the Senate, but I was okay with that, because that was the job I needed to play. And that is such an important thing to learn in service. Sometimes you're not going to get the gold star. Sometimes you're not going to get the A. Someone, somebody else is going to get that. But it doesn't matter because if you believe in it, you can fight for it and change the outcome. And so I realized there was an opportunity here. My name wouldn't be first, but I don't care. I believe so strongly in the need for repeal. So my job for a couple months was to convince Joe, which he winded up not only being the best champion in the world, but he really did bring people to the table. As soon as Joe signed on, Susan Collins signed on as the lead, and things really good things began to happen. And my job became telling stories. I told the stories of the men and women who were suffering under this policy. We launched an online community where anybody could tell their story. That made a difference because when you're actually trying to change something, whether it's in Washington in your PT or your P in your PTA meeting or even at your Girl Scouts troop, it's when real stories are what you're talking. When real people are the reason why you're fighting, and it made a difference. So. Speaking of making a difference and the fights, we've gotten some questions in from the audience that have been handed to me. Um, someone has asked, would you please comment on the NFL scandal and, and what should happen to Commissioner Goodell? What are your views on that, Kirsten? Well, I think the NFL has handled this so disgracefully, so oh. poorly. I can't imagine a worse way. To, 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 first of all, all the facts were known. This was not a question that was being debated. Uh, the player said, I beat my wife, and that's a picture of me pulling her out of the elevator unconscious. Uh, unconscious. Let's just underline so, that. So there, uh -huh. there, was, there was no facts, fundamental facts in dispute in this case. And for him to get a slap on the wrist, two-game suspension is outrageous. Uh, so I think the NFL handled this horribly. And if you look at the history of the NFL and other professional sports, they are horrible when it comes to violence against women and how they treat their players, their star players. And what it really is to me is this larger problem, which we fight against in sexual assault in the military and sexual assault in college campuses, where institutions are protecting their favorite person. So whether it's their favorite football star, whether it's their favorite soldier, whether, whatever it is, there's this institutional effort to protect their own self-interest. It's a fundamental bias. And when you have that bias, you cannot be objective, and justice isn't even possible. That's a challenge we have in the military, where these commanders may well be perpetrators or within the chain of command, but you know the, the commanders hold all the cards and they make sure it stays that way so that justice often is not possible because they want they have biases they have, you know, as I said, asses to cover and and people to protect and it's a real problem. Same thing true with college campuses. You have administrators who are poorly trained who don't want any rape stories to get out. It might hurt their recruiting when in fact they should be putting their students first and making sure the their schools are safe and making sure. Uh, that a woman or man who's assaulted gets justice. So I think it was terrible. Now, in terms of the question about Goodell, um, 
my first statement on it was he needs to lead this reform and he needs to get it right and he needs to use his position to make sure there's a zero tolerance. But now there's a debate about you know, when he knew and whether he was, he was truthful with the American people. If he's lied about this, then he has to step down. He won't have the legitimacy to lead the reform that's frankly really needed. So people have submitted these questions separately, but here's one that's a, a, a powerful follow-on to that. And that is, since the structures here themselves, the systems, are conceived by men, healthcare, law, banks, academy, government, we might add the NFL, do you really see that more women's involvement in inherently patriarchal structures can truly shift the values culturally? This is a question you only get in Boston. I think, <laughs> yeah, and, Go and, and my answer, <laughs> My answer is it's the only thing that really can. And I truly mean that. If you had 51% of women in Congress, do you think we'd have spent the last two Congresses debating whether women should have access to affordable contraception? No. It, it wouldn't happen. We would have had a very different agenda. We would have been talking about all the issues American families care about, from uh, national security to the economy to small businesses, everything. Uh, y y when women. Uh, when women have a seat at the table, the, the discussion, the, the, the substance shifts. And I'll give you one example of a congressional example. When I was first elected in 2006, I was put on the Armed Services Committee by Speaker Pelosi. She put five women on the committee that year who were new, and it shifted the debate. We were having hearings on military readiness, and our male colleagues focused on what they typically focus on, how many ships, how many aircraft, how many guns, all equipment, which is legitimate and important. But the women, we brought in a whole other level of debate of what's military readiness. I remember Gabby Gifford saying, the doctor in my district, in my base, said that you're sending 70% of our men and women back into combat who are not mentally able to do this, to this job. Why are you doing that? And I amplified her questions and said, you know, I've seen the statistics. The, the divorce rate, the domestic violence rate, and the suicide rate are higher than they've ever been in the history of America. Are you dealing with PTSD? What support do you have for our troops? And so what you had in that conversation was a wider range of issues being raised and a wider range of solutions being offered, and that's good for America. So I really believe if you had more, here's the corporate example, this one's funny, you like this. So if, if one woman is on a corporate board, yeah. that company is 40% less likely to have to restate their earnings. Think about that. Think about that. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. So one, woman. so one woman alone, and if you get three, that's, that's we call that the tipping point. Things mm -hmm. really change. But it even shows in corporate America, when women are on these corporate boards, when you have that benefit of diversity of, of views and viewpoints, better returns on investment, better returns on equity. Th these companies do better. So we should want that in every decision-making table all across America and all across the world because we would have different outcomes. So someone asks here, how do you deal with the ethics of being a politician? You've talked about the advocacy, the things you get out and fight for, but how about ethical challenges? Can we talk about those? Well, you know, for me, um, the reason why I do this job is because I really do believe I can make a difference. And, you know, I share a little bit of my faith in the book, some personal stories when I feel most down or most inadequate or most unable. Uh, and I tell a story, and for those of you who aren't religious, you, you don't know the story, but it's a pretty easy example. It's about Queen Esther, and she's a lady who was picked out of obscurity to uh, be the king's wife. And uh, it was a time in history when um, uh, she was Jewish and her husband didn't know it. And there was a plot at the time to kill all the Jews. And so her uncle comes to her and says, you know, you really have to do something about this. Um, you may well have been placed there at this time for a reason, and if you don't do what you need to do, uh, your family will be killed, the Jews will, will, will certainly suffer, um, but help will come from somewhere else. And so at the time she has to make this tough decision, how do I help the Jews when I'm not even allowed to go see my husband unless I have an appointment and I can't just ask for an appointment. So she decides to risk it and just goes and sees her husband and he doesn't kill her, but he lets her talk, which is nice, perfectly nice <laughs> back then. Um, so yeah, who would guess? No. And so mm -hmm. she's able to deliver this message very creatively, very uh, effectively, and she saves the Jews at the time. But that story is meaningful to me because I think it speaks to all of us, that all of us are placed where we are at any given time in history, in your community, uh, in your family, because you can make a difference. There's an opportunity that's inherent 
in all of us wherever we are at whatever time. And so I feel like my job in the U.S. Senate is to be the voice for the voiceless, to be the person who will take on lost causes, to be the person who will do something impossible like stand up to the entire Department of Defense. Because if I don't stand up, maybe nobody does. And I think Elizabeth is a perfect example of it. When she, I love the chapter about when she was asked to run. And she's like, I don't want to be a politician. I don't want to go to the Senate. I, don't want, I do not want to do that. She had no interest in, in being an elected leader. But she was told, Elizabeth, if you don't do this now, nobody can do what you can do. No one will fight for what you care about. No one has the knowledge and the passion that you do to fight for every person, every middle class family, everybody who's being screwed. And so Elizabeth was a perfect person at that perfect time. And she did it. She did something that was important and transformative because you had the courage to just do the one thing you were being asked to do that no one else could have done. So you're our, you're our Queen Esther. I love that soul searching moment. I really do. And I can, I can see her. I, I don't know Elizabeth that well, but we've gotten to serve for the last couple of years, and Elizabeth is totally driven by service. And I can see somebody guilting her, saying, you really need to do this. You know, if you don't do this, then you know, you're letting us all down. And her saying, oh, you're right. I'd be letting them down. I better do this. And then growing the confidence to get some miracle done. And it was amazing. Uh, so, so talk just for a minute. Oh, She's about. very selfless. She's um, a selfless woman. Yeah, enough, enough. True. <laughs> Fact. Fact. So, Fact. So talk just for a minute about Citizens United, though. Oh, yeah. About here we are. We're in public office. We're drawn to it yeah. because we do. Yeah. Both of us. Yeah. And I've I've watched you do this. Fight for people. Yeah. Who don't have someone to fight for them. You want right. to fight for this. Who don't have armies of lobbyists. Yeah, who... fighting for food stamps, take, take on a losing battle. Yeah. Because who's going to advocate for more food for the poor? The people who are struggling working two jobs at a time aren't going to come to Washington. And do they have lobbyists? Not a lot. Not a lot. No. So now we've got a world with Citizens United un yeah. effectively uh, uh, Unlimited spending. losing the mm -hmm. limits on totally. any kind of campaign spending. The money that people spend to yeah. put together these armies of lobbyists. What's going to happen to us, Kirsten? Well, again, if we had more women in politics, one of the first things we would do is publicly funded elections, I can guarantee you. Because when I ask a woman, <laughs> you, ask, you ask any, you know, ask the woman sitting next to you when this is over, would you ever run for office? Her first answer almost always, are you kidding me? Never. Why would I do that? Why would I put my name out there? Why would I take on all those negative attacks? Why would I would never do that to my family? I would never do that to my kids. We are we are adverse to the aggressiveness, the nastiness, and all the negative ads that are in politics. And so it's one of the main reasons why women don't run for office, because they don't like it. They don't like the landscape. We didn't create the rules, and we don't like the rules that you're at being asked to follow and, and the, the rules of, that, of this game. And so we often say, I'm not playing. I'm not doing it. So I think um, it, ha it is a necessity. Because what, what money in politics does, it has a long-term corrosive effect. And what a typical New Yorker will say is, well, if someone wrote you a check for $1,000, what did they buy for that? You know, they're definitely getting something. So the, it's the appearance of money and the appearance of impartiality that somebody gives you money that somehow you're no longer um, uh, you're no longer going to represent the values of the people of the state who elected you. You're going to represent the values of the special interest. And so it's corrosive. And when you have unlimited spending with no disclosure, it's even more corrosive. So when Elizabeth and I file our forms, you know every donor we have and how much they gave. You know, you know who they are, where they're from, you know, even their address. Bizarrely, but you do. Um, and so uh, the but for these ads, because this Supreme Court, which I believe is, is not representative of jurisprudence, to find, number one, that corporations have uh, the same free speech rights as individuals, I don't think that's a foregone conclusion. That's just the conclusion of this particular court. And second, that money is speech. Again, I don't think that's a foregone conclusion. And so under a different court, which is one of the reasons why I think the next presidential election is so important, and we have to elect a Democrat, is because if you have a right-leaning court, they find these conclusions. And we should have a, a, a decision that says money is not speech, and corporations are not people. And then we could end this constant flow of money. I would only add that before you jump to 2016, remember that in 2014, we've got a battle going on in the totally. Senate. To hold the balance of power. And it is so important. For those of you who are involved in politics, 
please get involved. Just pick one person you like. Elizabeth Warren is your senator. Um, <laughs> one person you like anywhere in the country that you believe in what he or she stands for and help them. You, you, can't, you can't underestimate how much just even $5 makes a difference and how much knocking on a few doors makes a difference. If you're willing to travel, there's a lot of at-risk seats that could use some door knockers. Yeah. So I've got a, one more question here that someone asks, and that is, do you get frustrated with the, and now the person has crossed out. It, it, you could have a long list of things you might get frustrated with, but they finally settled on Republicans' refusal to compromise. <laughs> what do you yeah, say? Uh, there's a lot of places where there should be much more common ground than there is, and it's, it's often the silly season of campaigns that unfortunately leave that common sense at the door. But I do find an exception to that, I must say, and it's among the women. And Elizabeth and I have this quarterly dinner with all the women senators, and we get to know each other as friends, as women, as mothers, as daughters, as sisters. Uh, and it's really important because when I'm trying to pass a piece of legislation, those senators know me well, and they want me to be successful and want to help, whether they're Democrat or Republican. And so an issue so important like banning insider trading by members of Congress, pff, of course, Susan Collins says, I'll help you with that, because it's common sense. Um, the same thing, true, Susan's there for me when we're repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, Lisa Murkowski and Olympia Snow, there for me when we're trying to get the 9-11 health bill passed. And on the sexual assault of women in the military, 20 out of 20 women either authored part of a bill or co-sponsored a bill to reform that. And we got about a dozen reforms finished. Even the last reform that was the boldest to take the decision making out of the chain of command, I had 17 out of 20 of the women. Yes, That's, you did. That is mass consensus. Mm -hmm. And so... We're, women, aren't, women aren't a monolith, we don't agree on everything, but oftentimes we want to find common ground and that is something you don't see enough of in Washington. So if we can elect more women, we can change the tone, change the nature, and hopefully have more who are interested in getting things done as opposed to scoring political points. Ah, your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> so I'm gonna let Kirsten, have the last word on this. Uh, it's, it's a book that is very much like this interview, a book full of enthusiasm and energy and optimism, and yet a book that calls it out mm -hmm. when you don't like what you see. So let me give you the last word here to be able to say, if you just get to take away one message from this book, yeah. what is it, Kirsten? The, the most important message of this book is that your voice matters. It truly does. You know, we doubt ourselves a lot. We sometimes think someone's going to be doing that. Someone will be in charge or they'll get it right. No, actually, no one's going to get it right. They won't be in charge and they won't, they won't actually have your views. So please be heard. It doesn't matter where. It, do it really doesn't matter what circle you're talking about, what platform you're talking from. You have no idea how powerful you can be, how many minds you can change, and how much you can change the world until you raise your voice. Oh, Kirsten. Fabulous. Thank you.